بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحمده وصلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الأول والآخر والظاهر والباطن وهو بكل شيء عليم رب الشح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لسان يفكه قولي There is a brother, or there is a group, a podcast that uh, made a video with a very strange title. Uh, the title of the video was Ashraf Ali Tanvi and the Strange World of Deobandis. And uh, it seems from the video that the intent was to attack the entire heritage of Darul Alum and uh, give wind to sectarian Islam. In a time where the Muslims are divided between traditional Islam and uh, liberal Islam, with all the problems that one may feel with traditional Islam, whatever problems you may feel that exist, but anyhow, for an average Muslim it would be agreed upon that traditional Islam is far better than any version of liberal Islam, no doubt. So in this sense, to make a podcast talking against probably the largest educational Islamic institute, and I'm going to talk about the historical contributions of this group through the words of another sheikh, as you'll see, because he says it very, very eloquently. He explains it very eloquently. In fact, we at one time gathered a bunch of uh, Muslim and non-Muslim intellectuals from the United States of America and took them to Pakistan to meet him and to talk to him. And one of the lectures he gave was about the history of the Muslims in the Indian subcontinent and the Islamic view of that and how this connects with the past and how this will be connecting with the future. The point being that uh, doing a podcast making fun of the largest Islamic uh, educational institute, and it's in fact more than that, as you'll see, uh, making fun of the inheritance of uh, Sheikh Ahmed Sarhandi and Shawlullah Muhaddad Delbi, and then after that, Mahmoud al Hassan, rahmatullah alayhim, uh, making fun of that, uh, this is outside the character of a Muslim. So, what we are going to talk about today, inshallah, is going to be very deep. Unfortunately, a lot of it's in the Urdu language, which I'll be translating. But this is why this is going to be a long video, because I want to do it, give it this topic. And, and, and because there is another uh, scholar who's already touched upon a lot of the issues from a fiqhi perspective. Mufti Yasir Nadim Al-Wajdi. Okay? He already did a very good critique of the... The, the, the critique of the fiqhi aspects uh, of Bakshi Zevar and some of the other uh, aspects that have to do with Islamic law. So I'm not going to touch on Islamic law, but I'm going to touch on the philosophical aspect that, uh, which is more according to my personality and, and that is the issue of Wahdatul Wujud. So I'll be talking about the issue of Wahdatul Wujud in detail and I recommend every Muslim needs to listen to this, because this has been the feeling, the research, the tahqiq, the agreement of the vast majority of the great scholars, okay? And uh, we'll be talking about this in, in, in more detail. Wahdat al-Wujud is something that's a, a permanent part of our Islamic history. It's a permanent part of our Islamic legacy, and unfortunately, people have confused it with pantheism, hama'us, which is the idea that God became matter. No, God. if God became matter, that's like God became Jesus. And that is shirk. So 
of course, uh, this is why there's a separate terminology for pantheism, hamaus, and a separate terminology, wahzatul wujud, oneness of existence. Okay, and I'm going to explain this uh, in some detail. Uh, and so now, uh, let's now start with the uh, first point, which is the the overall contribution of Dar al compared to any other Islamic institute in the Muslim world. Okay. So having said this, let us now uh, listen to this. So the uh, the modernists, in response to them, uh, institutions like Deoban, obviously they played a role. So Deoban became the central location as a defense for the naql of Islam, meaning the texts of Islam. Okay, this is a historical uh, fact, which will become clear as we go through this because it's a long conversation in Shalatan. So they created a bu bubble, you can say, of Qala Allah wa Qala Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The ulama of that time, they created a bubble, okay, of Qala Allah wa Qala Rasul, like Ashabul Kahf almost. And they went into this cave in order to protect themselves and bring other people into that atmosphere, into that uh, culture, into that environment. This will become more clear as we. It's not Darul Ulum is not just an educational center, rather a movement that has specific purposes. And because of, from which many activities and many educational centers, they started from Darul Ulum Deoband, and. It became the center of many Islamic activities. Everything from declaring the Qadianis as non-Muslims, as kafir, to, for example, Jama'a al-Islami, Jama'a al-Tabliq, the Tabliq Jama'at, that they went around the world and affected thousands, hundreds and thousands of lives. This is all the work of the same inheritance. Okay? So you know, for example, the idea of establishing, for example, in, this was in a historical context, establishing Islam and bringing Islamic laws, Mawlana Shabir Usmani played a role in that. You have Mawlana Ilyas who played a role in what I just talked about, Tablighi Jamaat. You have Anwar Shah Kashmir who became the great, a great muhaddis and the knowledge of hadith. And Dar al is a great place of knowledge of hadith, as you know. So, uh, to you know, and, and the 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 political movement of Sheikh Al Hind Muhammad Al Hassan Rahmatullahi these things can't be denied in history, and this is going to become more clear as I talk about this. Hatta ke upar hi ki misal ke mutabik hakikat ye hai ke barre sagir ki aksar dini darshgaho aur dini aur mazhabi tehrikon ka taluk bhi deoband ke saath wohi hai jo dunia bhar ki masajid ka khana kaaba ke saath aur barre sagir ke mazhabi anasir mein se sirf unko chhod kar so in India, when Muslims were in pantheism, a type of pantheism, which will also become clear as we have this discussion about Wahdat al Wujud in some detail. In India, Muslims that you know they were following an Islam, but it was a very, you can say, mixed Islam with Hinduism, reading Fatiha, someone died, some, you can say, rituals, some customs, someone is born, someone got married, someone died, these types of customs, they were there, but true understanding of the Ruh of Islam, the true understanding of the spirit of Islam was lacking. And so it was Dar al-Ulum 
that played a decisive role in really bringing out the different forms of Islamic activity uh, in, 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 in the Indian subcontinent. And mind you, there are ulama that study in Dar al-Ulum from around the world, but Dar al-Ulum, most of the schools are in all of Pakistan. Then you have Afghanistan, then you have India, then you have Bangladesh, and all the surrounding countries like Singapore and so on and so forth. They're all affected by, by this great school. So to have a podcast that is putting wind into sectarianism, and to have this podcast where you're basically becoming a modernist in the sense that uh, you know, you're, to be a modernist, you, ex you basically assume that what we have today is better than the past. And this is just another form of that. Oh, those people in the past, oh, they don't know anything. We know everything. Right? And so when you have this attitude that what we have today is better than what we had before, then you have, technically, you, you have a very big problem because that too, from a, from, a, from a spiritual sense, that becomes problematic because the foundations of Islam were not built in the 20th century. They were built in the 6th century. Okay, and so uh, you know, then you, if you were uh, someone in authority, you would have decided Islam should come today rather than before. Uh, anyway, I don't want to get into that, but the idea of modern is to be skeptical and of tradition and skeptical of the past, whereas the true Muslim is the one who's connecting himself to the past. And then there are those Muslims that want to connect themselves to the, you can say, to to the illusionary past. Uh, the illusionary past is what I call it, and I'll talk about that if I get a chance. تھوڑی سی مزاحت مزید کر دوں میں اس سے بھی پہلے یہ دو حضرات نے میر درد کا ایک شعر لکھ کر یہاں میری میز پر رکھ دیا تھا وہ چاہتے ہیں کہ میں آپ کو سنا دوں وہ جو میں نے آپ کو حدیث قدسی سنائی تھی جس کو محدثین اس کی سند جو ہے اس کو معتبر قرار نہیں دیتے لیکن مفسرین محققین نے تسلیم کیا ہے So he's now moved on to a different subject a little bit just temporarily and that is that while, there, you know, there's this narration of the Prophet Sallallahu in which the Prophet said that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala was a gun, he was a treasure, and he wanted to be known, so he created man. And while the hadith itself is weak, as many uh, hadiths that have jewels and wisdom in it are, but in its, uh, in its wordings, its meaning holds true. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونِي يَعْنِي يَعْرِفُونِي So you have a beautiful flower, the beautiful flower, it, it, only a human being, a man, looks at the flower and says, SubhanAllah, what a beautiful flower. And the same thing with the rest of the beautiful nature Allah has created. But the flower itself cannot appreciate itself. Only man can appreciate the flower in a special way. That even the flower, as beautiful as it is, as it is cannot appreciate itself. And so even though everything in the heavens and the earth is doing tasbih of Allah, but man's tasbih of Allah is with cognition, with perception, with conception, with, uh, with knowledge, right? And so he's going to read this. Allah Ta'ala bandai mu'min ke dil mein sama jata hai. Wo uska tarjuba jo hai. Sheer ki halat mein khaja mir dard. I'm not going to translate this. ارزو سما کہاں تیری وسط کو پا سکے میرا ہی دل ہے وہ کہ جہاں تو سما سکے یہ اسی کی ترجمانی ہے میں یہاں یہ کرنا چاہ رہا تھا کہ اہل حدیث تحریک جو ہے وہ بھی سو ایز فار ایز دی اہل الحدیث برادرز ار کنسرن ایک زمانے میں بہت زوردار تحریک کی حیثیت سے لدے بدعات so at one time the, the Ahlul Hadith movement also started with great, you can say, enthusiasm to remove bid'ah and to do away with kufr and ilhad and shirk against this. But but unfortunately, they became satisfied, you can say, with some symbolic elements, like saying, I mean, out loud or not out loud, uh, how, you know, how they do their prayers, raising the hands or not raising the hands. And that became the limit of their discourse, you can say. So, whereas 
Dar al-Ulum was doing a lot of activities, you know, working with at the constitutional level, if it's Mullah Shabir Usmani, for example, uh, or if it, uh, you know, uh, was a Jama'at al tabligh doing da'wah, being, being strong on da'wah, bringing people back to the masjid. There was a whole difference. So today, the most worst sectarianism is with the, the unfortunately, the Salafi or the Ahlul Hadith brothers and sisters. They're the most uh, judgmental, the most sectarian, and if they have even a smell of, oh, this person's doing something wrong according to Islam in terms of their aqidah or in terms of their fiqh. They look down upon them. And so this, you know, is very, very problematic. And uh, the Prophet warned us of this type of situation. So, you know, it became a matter of a few issues, and that became Ahlul Hadith or the Salafi. And then this meant now you're attached to the people of the past because you agree with XYZ. So, anyway, the point is that if you compare Darul Aloom with uh, the, the Tahrik or the movement, the Tahrik of Darul Aloom Deoband, as will become clear, the movement of the Darul Aloom versus you know, the Dar al-Ulum people, they stood up against the British Empire. They went to jail. They went to prison. They established educational institutions. They defended Islam. They defended the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ more than any other group. And this will become more clear as, as I show you what happens uh, in this context. <laughs> Now, they spent their whole time on these few issues, and this became uh, the Salafi movement, okay? And so, what I, uh, you know, you can say, uh, so, over here now, let us now listen to Dr. Asr Ahmed Ali in English, talking to a bunch of intellectuals from the United States, some are Muslims, some are non-Muslims, talking about the history of the Indian subcontinent and the foundations of Darul Alum Deoband. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this as a reminder to our Darul Alum ulama that they should know their history because many of them study the curriculum, but they don't know their own history. So they need to know their own history. And for the rest of the people that are critical, they need to be take a look at their own uh, you can say, uh, they need to respect the good that has been done, no matter where it comes from. Okay, And there are people that need to be respected, certain mujaddideen, people revived Islam, that, uh, that have to be very much respected regardless. So here. Now, let's listen to what Dr. Israhim Ali says to a bunch of American intellectuals in a discussion about the history of the mujaddideen and the history of Islam in the Indian subcontinent. And fifth and final Muhammad, alayhi salatu wassalam. Now after this institution of prophethood and messengerhood coming to an end, Allah gave a promise to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that he will keep on raising from among Muslims mujaddids Mujaddid means renewer, reviver. You may call reformers. They are not prophets. These, you know, Allah has promised, the Prophet said, that for in this Ummah, He will raise Mujaddids, renewers of Islam, Islamic faith, and Islamic practices. And washing it off from so, for example, the Prophet says, "Inna Allah yabasu ala ra'si kulli mi'atin amin, ala ra'si kulli mi'atin amin, man yujadidu lahadina." Allah will raise in the beginning, at the head of every century, people who renew this deen. 
So, for example, Umar bin Abdul Aziz was the first renewer. So now, listen to this. From the external influences which might have come through that century, 100 years, making it pure Islam, regarding the faith and the practices in every century. Now, for the first thousand years of Islamic history, or Muslim history, I should say, all the mujaddids appeared in the Arab world. Umar bin this is uh, very important that because, as you know, a lot of Islamic literature is in Farsi. And a lot of Islamic literature is in the Urdu language, which is inaccessible to the who? The Arabs. And I personally, after studying X amount of time, I'm close to my 50s now, I don't think you can have a full understanding of, a well-rounded understanding rather, of Islamic literature, Islamic knowledge, Islamic subjects without knowing at least Farsi, for example, in addition to Arabic. And I definitely think Urdu language is uh, extremely important in this regard too. But that is not to say that uh, you have to know Urdu, but I'm just simply saying that there is a lot of literature probably in many other languages besides Arabic, okay? But particularly, with particular reference to Darul Alum Deoban, literature in the Urdu language and in Farsi, that is there. And many of the revivers of Islam and the people who put down the foundation of Darul Alum, they were used to write in Farsi, used to write in the Farsi language. Abdul Aziz who revived caliphate for a short period and finished that monarchy of the Umayyads and the landlordship, etc., etc. Then Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, so on and so forth, Imam Ghazali, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, these are all Mujaddids, Ahmad Ibn Hanbal, a great Mujaddid. But the strange fact is that no sooner than the second thousand years started from 11th century Hijra, this institution of Mujaddideen was shifted to the South Asia. First of all, over here I want to mention the ayah in Sutul Jumu'ah in reference to this point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised a messenger amongst the Ummiyeen, meaning amongst the Arabs. Allah subhanahu wa So the Arab Prophet came and he taught them the book and the, 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 the Yatlu he recited to them the ayat and he purified them, teach them the halal and the haram, Yu'allimuhum al-kitab and the wisdom of the book. وَآخَرِينَ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ And others who have not yet joined them. Meaning, آخَرِينَ غَيْرُ الْأُمِّيِّينَ The non-Arabs who have not yet joined them. Okay. And the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when the Prophet put his hands on the shoulders of Salman, and uh, so they're part of the Ummiyin, the, the Persian. Anyway, so I just wanted to say that there is a small uh, hishara here. Ahmad Sarhandi, Mujaddid al Fasani, the Mujaddid of the second thousand years, because it had started. Now in Islam in Southeast Asia and Islam in Turkey and from there those people who would know the writings of Sayyid Nursi and the writings of many of the scholars of Turkey, they are influenced by what? Sheikh Ahmed Sarhan, uh, Sar, uh, Sarhandi was Naqshbandi, so that Turkey is all Naqshbandi. All of these uh, Russian states, Dagestan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, they're all Naqshband, they're all Naqshbandi, Naqshbandi Islam. And so, the uh, the influence of Sheikh Hamman Sarhandi, not just in the Mughal Empire, but he's called, I believe, Sheikh Rabbani in Turkey, and uh, his influence was so so big, so vast, so much, so strong. 
So this needs to be kept in mind that when this is the person, one of the people who put the foundations of Dar al the Obama. And this is for uh, the people that, for us Muslims for, that are from Southeast Asia, they should know their history of Islam and how Islam became revived slowly. Because when Islam started there with Sheikh Ahmed Sarhandi, Islam was just by name, just by ritual, just by customs. They even had wrong thoughts. Even there was ideas of pantheism, that God is in everything. And so this will become clear. What he did, he washed away the influences that came against Islam during the time of the great Mughal Emperor Akbar, Akbar the Great. He said, and he was advised by some ulama, his court belonged to his court, that Allah's one day is equal to our 1000 years. This is twice appeared this thing in Quran. One day of Allah is according to your calendar, it is 1000 years. So Islam of Muhammad was for 1,000 years only. Now that 1,000 years has come to an end. Now a new religion is required. And I am giving you the new religion called deen ilahi Only keeping the Prophet aside. He tried to join. Take something from Hinduism, take something from Buddhism, take something from Islam and mix it up and make it a new deen. It was actually politically motivated. He knew that the subcontinent is a very big power, very big force. But the hurdles in its coming up in the world is this division on the basis of religion. So there has to be amalgamated all these things together and a mixture provided. And actually, it was the Rejection of the Sharia of Muhammad. And you know the identity of the Ummah was based on the Sharia. So bypassing the prophethood. Now, Islam is gone. It loses its identity. Secondly, at the same time. I told you when Islam entered subcontinent, there was mysticism. It has both elements, Islamic mysticism, yes, but the Neoplatonic element. Here it got influence from the Hindu mysticism also. And now when these mysticisms, they came together, the result was sort of pantheism. Pantheism is just contrary to Islam. Islam is based on Tawheed, he is alone. This, this universe is his creation, not the part of his person, not at all. So under this pantheistic, although the Wahdatul Wujud, unity of being of Ibn Arabi is somewhat different. Wahdatul Shahud of Ahmad Sarhandi is somewhat different. But the, upon the masses, the influence was that of pantheism, pantheistic mysticism. And Islam was going to be lost. And I may bring to your attention that India is very famous in this, Hindus. They assimilated any religion, putting an end to that religion, assimilating it into their, their own religion. What to speak of any religion which had come from outside? Even Buddhism was born in India. It was finished. Now you go and see it in Thailand or somewhere, you know, in the Far East, Southeast. In India, there's no Buddhism. Although Buddha was born there, he preached there. In the same way, Hindu must want it that Islam should also be absorbed and finish its identity as a separate religion. Now these two things, one coming politically from the emperor, Mughal the Great,
the great mogul and the other coming from mysticism all these influences were washed away by this mujaddid of the 11th century of hijra sheikh ahmed sarhandi so this alone can begin to tell you that dar ulum is not just an educational but also politically active a great defender of islam and and will continue to study this and the identity of muslim umma was preserved and the maximum emphasis now came on following the prophet and iqbal in his own in his footsteps says ma mustafa bar asan khi shirak di hama us agar bau na rasidi tamam bula bis to take yourself to the feet of muhammad because islam is but muhammad nothing but muhammad and if you not go to him it's all falsehood bula bis to the infidel uncle of muhammad abu lahab who was the bitterest enemy of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so this was re established then came in the next century a great intellectual giant now this is a very important point so mujad al afsani passes and then right after that that was shah waliullah of delhi by the way shah waliullah muhaddas delhi's students were teachers of muhammad bin abdul wahhab just to kind of like give you shaulila muhaddas delhi teached taught as zabidi as zabidi taught as sindi as sindi taught muhammad bin abdul wahhab on the one side and on the other side as sindi taught muhammad jibril who taught uthman bin polio who established the khilafa in west africa the sokoto khilafa okay of uthman bin polio so the influence of shaulila muhaddas delhi has been international and it will even become more important as you understand further he one person can be equated with the whole team in europe who revived the knowledge <coughs> So the Renaissance, whether you say it started with Martin Luther or Descartes, going all the way down to David Hume and Nietzsche, what they revived in 500 years, Shaulila Muhaddas Dilbi Rahmatullahi Alaihi revived in as one person in, in one century as an individual. And one of the things, and uh, you know, one of the uh, the things that leads to is Darul Ulum Deoband. But just to give you an example that he is going to also mention that. Shaulila Muhaddas Dilbi rahmatullahi alayhi was the first person to translate Quran into the Persian language from which all the other translations in the world because before that it wasn't considered allowed just listen he's so big a person first of all he revived all the islamic sciences and knowledge from its ultimate sources as i told you quran had receded into background because the court language during this this islamic rule in india was persian not arabic i told you this islam was a mixture of arabism and iranianism and turkishism so quran had receded people didn't know what quran is saying they only recited it to get some sawab we call it some reward in the here after because we are reciting and reading the word of allah and the book of allah that's all people didn't know what is written in it they revered quran they respected it they loved it they honored it recited it but they didn't know even to the extent that among the ulama it was a sin to translate it quran into any other language it was this intellectual giant who started translation of quran himself into persian because that was the court language 
and then his three sons into Urdu. One only gave a translation. The second one gave a translation of his own with some explanatory notes. The third one wrote a full exegesis. We call it tafsir of Quran. So back to Quran. The original source of knowledge. This process, back to Quran, Ruju ilal Quran, go back to Quran. This started in the 12th century after Hijra by no less a person than Shah Waliullah Dehlavi. The real spirit of Quran and the emphasis is put on jihad. I told you, Quran says there can be no salvation without jihad. There can be no iman without jihad. When Quran was opened, Jihad meaning here, not qital, but rather the conviction that we have to struggle for the deen. Okay, and uh, I'll talk about this maybe a little bit later. Now, jihad came into the focus. So in the 13th century of Hijra, now the Mujaddid was Sayyid Ahmad Bareli, the same Sayyid, Ahmad, Ahmad, Ahmad Sarhandi, Ahmad Bareli. Sayyid Ahmad Brailvi, and his main lieutenant was the grandson of Shah Waliullah, Shah Ismail. They waged a campaign, struggle. The purpose was to oust the Britishers from India and return and make it. So while our Salafi brothers were fighting with the British, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh, uh, you know, these to you, Shaulullah and his, his grandchildren and those, uh, Sheikh al Hind, uh, Sheikh al Mahmud, Mahmud al Hassan, they were fighting against the British. So you can see the contrast here. The legacy one left versus the legacy the other left. India again, Darul Islam, because Muslims were ruling it. They snatched power from us. But strategically, he started his jihad, or qital, I should say here, from the northwest frontier area. Because there the hinterland was Islamic, Afghanistan, go to Afghanistan, Iran, Turkestan. And Punjab, you know, was at that time occupied by Sikhs. And they were persecuting Muslims badly. He migrated to the northwest frontier province, but he committed a mistake. He, as soon as reached there, he established Islamic State and forced Sharia in form. The local population resented. They had their own customs. Keep in mind, Mufti Yasser. His program that I mentioned earlier, that he made a fiqhi response to uh, to that program done by the uh, the Mad Mamluks, and uh, uh, I will mention something in regards to something that he said that I think is extremely significant. Their social customs. So there was a revolt from within. People betrayed him. So many people who came with him from as far as Bengal, Bihar, UP, these were the three most important provinces of India from which people joined hands with Sayyid Ahmad Brailvi. As a result, he failed. He was martyred in 1831 at Bala Court about 200 miles to the northwest of Lahore. But he revived the spirit of jihad. In the 14th century, we had Sheikh ul Hind. And there's another anti-British activist 
who actually sent down the main foundations of Dar al-Ulum And these three are interconnected. Now listen. Maulana Mahmoud Hassan of Deoband. He again started the freedom movement. But he wanted help. From it was called the Reshmi, Reshmi Ramal, like the Silver Handkerchief Movement. And the British found out about his movement. They caught him and put him in jail for four years. From Afghanistan and from Darul Khilafah, Turkey. If we get help from there and from inside India, we stand up in revolt, we can make the Britishers run from here. That attempt also failed. But this process and this lineage of Mujaddis, this lineage, this lineage leads to Darul Ulum have left impression on the general mind of Muslims of the subcontinent. Maybe you call it the... And in a globalized world, on the minds of the Muslims that are aware of their history, because this was one of the most beautiful aspects of our history was this revival of Islam, and as it continues to be, the revival of Islam from Mujad al Afsani to Shaulullah Muhaddis Delvi, all the translations of Quran coming from his thinking, his thought. And then you have uh, Sheikh al Hind. And uh, so belittling this, this legacy is a wonder. Like, why would a Muslim do that? Why would you do that? I and mean, this is like serious stuff. This is not about sectarianism. This is not my group group versus your group. This is not about, this is about Islamic history. It's about the hard work and blood and sweat of people, which will become more clear as I talk about this issue. The collective subconscious of the Muslims in India has the influences of Sheikh Ahmed Sarhandi, Shah Waliullah Delavi, Sayyid Ahmed Delavi, and Sheikh Ulim. Now we come to the 20th century. So that was the foundation. Okay, now let's look at Sheikh Sheikh Al Hind, Mahmoud Al Hassan, Rahmatullah Ali. He was he's going to talk about him and what was his thinking after four years of being in jail and what he said after being four years in jail after the British had released him. What did he have to say? Who were his students? What influence did they have? So let's try to understand this now. The thing that combines the hearts is the Quran. Asiri se rihai paane ke baad Vapas jab aay hai to Deoband mein ulama ke ek bade ishtima se khitab So now Dar al-Ulum is established Sheikh Mahmoud al-Hassan was taken to prison When he came back He gave A talk That is also recorded by Mawlana Muhammad Shafi rahmatullah alayhi His tafsir in English is available even till today It's one of the best tafsir Aap kar ke kahi Mawlana Mufti Muhammad Shafi and you know, the Sheikh al Mashaikh had his great great students, uh, Shah Kashmir, Rahmatullah, uh, uh, Shabir Usmani Rahmatullah Mawlana Muhammad Shafi Rahmatullah was himself there. So many of his great, Mawlana Hassan Madani Rahmatullah so his great students who I will talk about to some degree. But now listen. And he said, Hazrat Shaykh Al-Hinn, we have done so many years of our life so when he went, came out of jail and he 
was talking to students and I said, look, I was four years in jail and I thought about why Muslims are in this situation today. And he thought, what? He said, I came to a conclusion of two things. Because of two reasons Muslims are in the situation that they're in. مولانا مفتی شفیع لکھتے ہیں ان کی کتاب وحدت امت کے نام سے کہتے ہیں کہ پورا مجمع ہما تنگ گوش ہو گیا کہ یہ شیخ الشیوخ استاد ال مولانا محمد شفیع رحمۃ اللہ علیہ says that when شیخ محمد الحسن was saying these words everyone was pin drop silence pin drop silence علماء عمر کے اس آخری درجے میں اس حد پر آ کر اب نیا سبق کون سا سیکھ کر آیا تاکہ ہمیں تو اس کے دو سبب معلوم ہوئے ایک ہمارا قرآن کو ترک کر دینا لفظ نوٹ کیے ترک کر دینا اور فرسٹ از لیونگ قرآن نوٹس دا ورڈ ہی یوز ہی سیڈ لیونگ دا قرآن ترک ترک القرآن اور لیونگ دا قرآن دا کوشچن از ہاؤ کین دی اسکالر آف اسلام ہیو لیفٹ قرآن ابویسلی دے ڈینٹ ڈینائی قرآن دے لفٹ قرآن دے ریڈ قرآن سو وٹ ڈی مین بائی دس دوسرا ہمارے آپس کے اختلافات And the other is our differences in sectarianism amongst ourselves, which unfortunately this podcast is. He said, the rest of my life now I'll spend on opening, you can say, maktabs or libraries or places of study of Quran so people can learn how to read Quran and number two and he said number two I'm going to make public awareness of Quran of the message and the wisdom of Quran and who's saying this Sheikh Al Hind who according to Dr. Salam Rahmatullahi is the mujaddid of the 14th century of Islam. Or number two, ye ke aapas ke ikhtilafat ko hawada di jaye. And don't give wind to our differences amongst the Muslims. And Mawla Muhammad Shafi, rahmatullah alayhi, he says, when he was writing this, he says, in fact, these two things are also one, because our differences occur because of our not being aware of the message of Quran. Ye waqiyah quote karke Mufti Muhammad Shafi sahab likhte hai, حضرت شیخ نے جو دو باتیں کہیں اصل میں وہ ایک ہی ہے ہمارے باہمی اختلافات بھی تو اسی وجہ سے ہیں کہ ہم نے قرآن کو ترک کر دیا بتائیے شیخ الہند نے کیسے ترک کیا قرآن مولانا مدنی نے کیسے ترک کر دیا قرآن ہاؤ ڈیڈ مولانا مدنی نے قرآن کیا مطلب اس طرح کرنے کا وٹ از اٹ مین حال تو یہ ہے کہ مولانا مدنی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ حالانکہ وہ تو گرفتار نہیں ہوئے تھے وہ تو والنٹیرلی اپنے شیخ کی خدمت کے لیے گئے ہیں ساتھ مولانا مدنی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ ہی ہی ونٹ ہی ڈنٹ گیٹ اریسٹڈ ہی ونٹ وتھ شیخ الہند بیکاز ہی گاٹ اریسٹڈ ٹو سرو ہز شیخ اور اس حد تک ان کی وفاداری اور ان کی خدمت گزاری کہ رمضان کا مہینہ آیا تو حضرت شیخ شیخ الہند نے حسرت کے ساتھ کہا زندگی میں یہ پہلا رمضان ہوگا کہ تراوی میں قرآن نہیں سن سکیں گے ان سو شیخ محمود الحسن سیڈ ان رمضان ون ہی واز ان جیل ہی واز ان پرزن ہی سیڈ دس ول بی مائی فرسٹ رمضان ان وچ انفارچونیٹلی آئی ول ناٹ بی ایبل ٹو لسن ٹو قران میننگ دا ہول اف قران ان ان شیخ الہند واز ناٹ اے حافظ اف قران پٹھانوں میں سے تھے کوئی حافظ نہیں تھا اب آپ غور کیجیے استاد اور اپنے شیخ کی اس حسرت کو دور کرنے کے لیے مولانا مدنی روزانہ ایک پارا حفظ کرتے تھے اور رات کو تراوی میں سناتے تھے سو دا اسٹوڈنٹ مولانا مدنی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ یوز ٹو میمورائز قران ون جوز ایوری ڈے اینڈ ریڈ ان دا تراوی پریئرز ایٹ نائٹ سو دیٹ ہز شیخ 
can listen to the whole of Quran in the month of Ramadan. So this man with this closeness to Quran is saying we left the Quran. And he's saying this to himself and his students. One juz a day. And it's not difficult because they already knew the Quran. They already knew the words. They already knew Arabic. They already knew Sarf and Nav and all of that. They just had to bring the connections and it wouldn't be too hard for them. اصل میں قرآن کو ترک کرنے کا مطلب کیا ہے وہ اصل میں ایک اور بہت بڑے عالم دین کی بات سنیے آپ What did it mean to leave Quran? Now Anwar Shah Kashmir رحمت اللہ علیہ clarified this meaning of that Sheikh Mahmud al-Hassan رحمت اللہ علیہ what he meant and this is the problem we are in that Shah, uh, Anwar Shah Kashmir رحمت اللہ علیہ is mentioning this is the problem that we have today a very important point, a very important point. Marana Sayyid Anwar Shah Kashmiri Rehmatullah Alayhi Jho Deoband se aakar aapke kharib mein Dabhel mein unho ne madrasa qaim kiya tha. Woh ek martaba qadiyan mein ek jalsa ulama kiya karte thay har saal. Radde qadiyaniyat ke liye. There used to be a jalsa or a majlis or a conference and uh, like a mu'tamar can say like a conference where people are, uh, came together once a year to speak against the Qadiani fitna. Okay, it was a big issue at that time, and uh, I can't go into the details of that, but it was a very big fitna, and it was very uh, intellectual and had uh, anyway. So, uh, so the scholars were there. تو ایک سال اسی طرح وہاں علماء جماعت ہے اب جس نے یہ واقعہ بیان کیا ہے اس کا نام میرے ذہن میں اس وقت نہیں ہے کہ میں صبح صبح مولانا انور شاہ کاشمیری رحمت اللہ علیہ کی خدمت میں حاضر ہوا تو دیکھا کہ غم کی تصویر بنے بیٹھے ہیں بہت اداس غم جون سو ون اف ہز اسٹوڈنٹس ہی وینٹ ان میت دی شیخ انور شاہ کاشمیری رحمت اللہ علیہ ڈائریکٹ اسٹوڈنٹ اف محمود الحسن اینڈ سو دا ہی از سٹنگ اینڈ ہی از سو سیڈ so sad. He's a picture of sadness. I asked the Prophet, what is the problem? Is there a special reason? He said, what is the reason? I am thinking that I am going to do my life and I am going to do my life. He said, what? I've wasted, I'm just thinking that I've wasted my entire life. I wasted my entire life. You wasted your entire life? جیسے <laughs> 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 اور فقیح دونوں اعتبارات سے بنے تو آپ نے پڑھنے پڑھانے میں سیکھنے سکھانے میں ساری عمر گزار دی تو آپ کی زندگی ضائع کیسے کہنے لگے ہم نے سارا زور اسی پر رکھا سو انور شاہ کشمیر رحمت اللہ علیہ سیز وی پٹ آل آر ایفرٹ اینڈ آل آر انرجیز ان ٹو وچ فقی پوزیشن از رائٹ وچ فقی پوزیشن از رانگ even though this is not a question, essential question for us on the Day of Judgment. And it is possible that even this was an issue in which we were possible, even though we know we are right, but there's a possibility of being wrong. And we know their position is wrong, but there's a possibility of being right. While we are arguing about all these issues, what types of fitnas and bulumath and dark misses are spreading over the Muslim world, and we're involved in these issues and rather than the real issues that are plaguing the Muslim Ummah. Allah <laughs> 
we're arguing about these things and all sorts of darknesses and, and th things leading us astray are taking over us. حالانکہ زیادہ سے زیادہ یہ کہا جا سکتا ہے کہ قول و اصحاب نا ثواب محتمل الخطا اور جو قول دوسروں کا ہے وہ خطا ہے محتمل الثواب زیادہ سے زیادہ یہ کہہ سکتے ہیں ہم کہ ہمارے جو اسلاف ہیں ہمارے جو اساتذہ ہیں ان کا قول صحیح ہے اگرچہ اس کے خطا ہونے کا بھی امکان ہے ہم یہ نہیں کہہ سکتے کہ اس کے غلط ہونے کا کوئی امکان ہی نہیں معصوم تو وہ نہیں تھے اور قول و ہم ان کا جو ہمارے سامنے ہے مد مقابل ہے اور وہ شافی ہے The big uh, clash was between the Hanafi and the Shafi fiqh, which is an interesting subject in itself. And so, spending all our time trying to prove them right or and proving ourselves, uh, proving them wrong and ourselves right, when all this jahala is spreading. <laughs> اور ہم نے اپنی ساری زندگی اس کام میں لگا دی لیکن میں کہہ نہیں سکتا اس پر کتنے رنج اور صدمے کا اظہار کروں کہ مجدد وقت سو دس از دس از دا ایشو رائٹ سو ناؤ لیٹس ڈیل ود دا ایشو اف وحدت الوجود سو آئی ہیو شون یو دیٹ دار النون دیوبند whether you're looking at Tablighi Jamaat, whether you're looking at its pioneers or founding fathers like Shaulila Muhaddis Delhi, who fought against the British. You have then, before that, Sheikh Ahmed Sarhandi, who fought against the King Akbar, so to say, and or rebelled against him. Then you have uh, Sheikh Mahmoud al-Hassan, who fought against the British and was caught and put in prison. These are people that, these are not just, uh, you know, uh, couch potato intellectuals, okay, like you find in this podcast, couch potato intellectuals who are, who are just spreading nonsense. And their level of knowledge is nothing, as will be shown to you very soon, inshallah, today when I talk about one of the major issues that I think is very misunderstood and needs to be clarified and made right, okay? And that is the issue of... Uh, the issue of wahdatul wujud, the oneness of existence. Okay, and so let us uh, now focus on that. But I think I've established the fact that the intellectuals, even non-Muslims, accept this because they're listening to his lecture. And if they ever had an objection, trust me, in the other lectures, they did object. But this is uh, a fact that this is a great revivalist tradition that Darul Ulum is part of. Okay. Has to provide the, the, the now, Mufti Yasin Nadim says something very important. Just coming out on social media and making this silly accusation uh, does not, does not uh, uh, serve any purpose. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I am from Deoban. I was raised there. I studied under the, these mashayikh. And uh, I cannot recall a single incident uh, where... Uh, they were practicing black magic. As and if you want to see their official position, for example, Hazrat Hanvi Rahimahullah is the is the main person they are accusing. Let's see what Hazrat Hanvi Rahimahullah wrote himself about black magic. Okay. You know, I have. Uh, in fact, you have uh, everything on deck, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so he he t he talked about amaliyat. Forget about black magic. Mm -hmm. He talked about amaliyat in his book. It's called. Uh, Amaliyat, uh, just a second. Uske shari ahkam. Actually, I wanted to show another part, but we can listen to this because it goes segues into the next part. So the shari ruling of amaliyat and tawizat. And tawizat okay. All right. So on page 24, this is what he says. <coughs> amaliyat and tawizat, agar sahi or jayz ho, mm -hmm. if they are permissible. Mm -hmm. Meaning, what you're saying is permissible, it's not shirk, it's not kufr. Tabhi. ان کی حیثیت دنیاوی اسباب اور طبی تدبیر کی طرح ہے ایون دین دیر لائک گیٹنگ میڈیکل ٹریٹمنٹ سو وٹ یو تھنک آف میڈیکل ٹریٹمنٹ از اٹ اٹ از جسٹ جائز دیر فور تعویزات اینڈ عملیات آر جسٹ جائز اینڈ دیٹ ٹو اف دے آر پرمیسبل 
uh, Imdadia, Imdadul Fatawa. Uh, someone asked him a question. The question is, it's uh, by the way, volume number uh, six. Yeah. So the question comes to Hazrat Hanvi Rahimahullah. He says, Mujko isme shuba ho gaya hai. Wo ye ke na jayes jhar phunk ya ke jayes jhar phunk jaysa ke aksar dastur hai ke Quran Sharif ki ayat se jhar phunk karte hain aur mein mutlaq nahi karta to ye khayal mera kharaab to nahi hai. Meaning he's trying, to, he's trying to ask that there are two types of jhar phunk yani mm-hmm. amaliyat, ruhiyat. Yeah. One is permissible, the other is uh, impermissible. Permissible. I don't do any of those. So, is is it okay if I don't do any of those? And if I just uh, avoid amaliyat completely, ruqya completely, is my aqidah fine? So, is my aqidah acceptable? This is what he's asking. And Hazrat Hanvi rahimahullah said, Jais to hai. Meaning, if you are practicing and exercising the jais amaliyah, the permissible mm-hmm. ones, and we've already spoken about how they're going to be permissible. Just how, now. right? Yeah. And then he's saying, "Jais is permissible, but it's better that you don't do it." And aapka aqida theek hai, meaning if you never exercise amaliyat and ruqya uh, in your life, your aqida is perfectly fine, no problem with that. So uh, this is Hazrat Hanvi rahimahullah talking about uh, amaliyat yeah. and black magic is like is haram is. Go for in cer- certain uh, circumstances, and he himself gave fatwa uh, about it in Imdadul Fatawa in multiple places. Multiple places, and that is coming from one of the elite, like the top top people of 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 the Oban. So I mean, um, there's nobody better than that that you can look at and 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 prove the point from there. And so if I move forward. <coughs> Because you know they had they had a couple of things. Uh, I, yeah, uh, I hope you don't mind me asking. No, no. Um, <clears throat> the next thing that um, they brought up was again like the elite or the teachers of Deoband. Um, <clears throat> they use jinns, right? And they use jinns to their benefit. Okay, a serious allegation. Uh, I don't know if this guy met one of called ulama Deoband ka dini ruh or unka maslaki mizaj. A very famous book. So, on page 190, he said, and I have to, I read, غور کیا جائے تو شریع اسطلاح میں ان ساتو سنابل کا خلاصہ چار ارکان ایمان, اسلام, احسان اور اعلائے کلیمت اللہ ہیں. So, what he's saying. So, what the foundation of Dar Alum is, what is Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and number four, ilai kalimatullah, to make the deen of Allah most supreme, to make the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most supreme. These are the four foundations of this educational institution. To teach Islam, to teach Iman, to teach Ihsan, and to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supreme. This is the foundation. Now, how is certain specific madrasa, how successful they have been or not have been, that's a separate issue. Okay? But I thought this point that Mona Yasser or Mufti Yasser Nadim, uh, may Allah bless him, he made, this was very, 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 uh, very, very important. Okay? That these are the, the char arkan, iman, islam, ihsan, or ilai kalimatillah, to make Allah most supreme and to do the things that make Allah most supreme, like spread his word, educational centers, establish the deen of Allah to bring the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth, all of this. When you keep in mind the history of these mujaddideen, then you will appreciate the, um, you will appreciate what uh, these four uh, goals mean, right? And uh, yes, a lot of times there are Darul Alums who don't teach their children or their students that the Quran should be the center of what they're doing. Who don't teach that you need to get out of the sectarianism. But that is what the foundation is of Darul Ulum. And this foundation is solid. It is rock solid. And it is the inheritance of great revivers of Islam. And so now let us look at another issue, which is the issue of uh, of Wahdatul Wujud.
جہاں تک ابن عربی کا تعلق ہے ہمارے ہاں یہ دو اپوزٹ کولز ملتے ہیں بزرگوں کے ایک انتہا پر ابن تیمیہ ہے رحمۃ اللہ علیہ جن کے بارے میں میں نے آپ کو بتایا کہ انہوں نے اس طرح سمجھا ہے اس طرح اترتا ہے اللہ جیسے میں یہ نمبر پر اتر رہا ہوں یہ کیا ہے سو امنگس دی کیبرین if we can accept Zimakshari, even he was a Mu'tazil like his tafsir, because overall what he said was good. In the same way with Imam Nitaimiya, rahimullah, uh, even though he's controversial, but he's on one side who believes that, you know, this, now I'm talking about Wahdatul Wujud in some detail, okay, the concept of oneness of Allah's existence, the oneness of Allah's existence, what does it really mean? So on the one side you have the opinion of uh, people like Imam Nitaimiya, And I actually believe he didn't have this opinion, but this was a narration put upon him. Okay. And that is that, you know, Allah comes down the way we come down from stairs, meaning it's, uh, you know, this world is created, Allah is there, we are here. Okay. So this concept, Allah is there, we are here. And Allah is here with his safat. And so they make a distinction between the zat of Allah and the safat of Allah. <laughs> big scholar of Quran and Hadith, even, uh, even uh, Hassan Nazmi rahmatullahi he accepted this and put him in amongst the people that contributed to Islam greatly. So that's fine. And the other side was Ibn Arabi in our inheritance of Islam who felt that nothing exists except for Allah. So the distinction between uh, Allah is Allah and the creation and those that said nothing exists except for Allah. So the Ibn Arabi versus what? Uh, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah. Rahimullah. And all the mystics, whether it be Imam Zali or Imam, uh, Imam Nawi and you go on and on on the list, they all consider Muhyuddin Arabi to be what? be the Shaykh Al-Akbar. Akbar. And if only the Shaykh will say the Shaykh, then the Murad of Ibn Arabi will say. And if in literature, if they say the Shaykh, the Shaykh, they mean Ibn Al-Arabi. And Ibn Taymiyyah says that he is a Zindiq, a Mulhid. And Imam Taymiyyah considers him a Zindiq, a Mulhid, a Kafir. These are the two extremes. These are the two extremes. Normally, our Salafi brothers, the Ahli Hadith brothers, they're followers of Imam Ibn Taymiyyah in the Aqaid, in the belief. What is their opinion? Allah Ta'ala is in every place, if it is in the same way. Allah is everywhere in His in his safat, in his attributes, in his knowledge, in his uh, al-basir, al-sami, he's everywhere in his attributes, but not in person, not in his that. He's on his arsh. Now in this idea that Allah is there, we are here, you have a anthropomorphic uh, aspect and you have a limitation because as if someone is not somewhere, then that's a limitation. If you say Allah is not here, then Allah became limited. He's then in another place, in a specific place. He became limited. It was this problem that Wahdat al-Mujud was trying to solve. Now, I'm going to go into details about this, so you have to be patient so that the whole issue becomes clear. And so that by this, I'm able to show you that the level of intellectual depth, what it was and what it is. One thing is this. And the common man also understands this. And for the average Muslim, it's enough as long as he knows Allah is my Razik, Allah is my Khalik, Allah is 
Allah, he's my Rabb, he's the one I have to make dua to. Allah is the one who's going to solve my problem. He's the one who's going to take me out of difficulties. If he knows this from a dini perspective, from a shari perspective, his deen is complete. But you know, but questions of philosophy and ilmul kalam, they make they make it. You have to ask these questions. That if Allah is unlimited, then then the issue of Allah being unlimited. Ab ye falsafa hai. Sifat e bari taala. Agar qadim hai sifat, to ye gussa. Ye to qadim nahi ho sakta. Gussa to kisi kam par aaya. Khushi to kisi kam par hui. Ye qadim kaise hoga? So he's talking about the complexity of the issue by giving the example of if you're angry, angry, Allah is qadim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is eternal. And something, an attribute like anger, anger is not eternal. Happiness is not eternal necessarily. And I am saying that in the way of the way of the way of اب اس سلسلے میں علامہ اقبال نے جو بات کہی ہے جو پروفیسر یوسف سلیم چشتی برہوم نے مجھے بتایا تھا کہ انتقال سے صرف تین ماہ قبل یہ اشار کر رہے ہیں وحدت الوجود کے بینتی ازم کے دونوں کے شدید مخالف تھے علامہ اقبال was completely against the idea of وحدت الوجود in the beginning of his life until the end time of his life اسی لیے وہ حافظ کو بھی بہت بڑا گمراہ کن شاعر سمجھتے تھے اس لیے کہ وحدت الوجود کے عامیانہ انداز میں جو ہے وہ شاعری میں جب اس کو آ گیا ہے تو عوام کے زبان پر جب چڑھا ہے تو وہ اس کے ڈانڈے پینتھیزم سے مل گئے بیکاز پیپل ایٹ لسن ٹو پوائنٹ پوائنٹری ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ نتھنگ ایگزسٹ ایکسپٹ فار اللہ اٹ لیڈ ٹو اے فارم اف پینتھیزم سو اقبال واز ویری اگینسٹ دس عوام کے اندر اس کا تصور یہ ہو گیا لیکن آخر میں انہیں بھی آنا پڑا ہے تو اے ناداں دلے آگاہ دریاب اے نادان وہ دل تلاش کر جو آگاہ ہو سو ان ہیز پوئٹری سیز او فولش ون لک لک فار ہارٹ دیر از اویئر اس سے واقف ہو لا موجود الا اللہ دریاب لا موجود الا اللہ So let me explain this. La ilaha illallah, the three levels. The first Islam, then you can say Iman and Ihsan, and then the Wahdat al Wujud. La ilaha illallah at the level of Islam. La ma'buda illallah. There's nothing to worship except Allah. La razik illallah. There's no razik except Allah. Allah gives you no one with you. لا حل المشكلات إلا الله. There's no one who will solve my problem except for this. لا إله إلا الله. At the level of Islam. لا إله إلا الله at the level of إحسان. لا مطلوب إلا الله. There's no مطلوب, no desire, no no thing to be desired except for Allah. لا محبوب إلا الله. There's nothing to be loved except Allah. La maqsuda illallah. And there's no maqsud, there's no goal, there's no purpose other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But these two make a distinction between into a duality. You are on one side, Allah is the Rabb, you're up. The third level, which is not a requirement, requirement, even though most of the mystics of Islam have accepted it, is la mawju, is existence. La mawjuda illallah. Nothing exists except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let me explain this further. La muta'a illallah. La muta'a illallah. Again, this is part of Islam. There's no one to be obeyed except Allah. La shari illallah. There's no one to give you sharia except Allah. La 
حَاكِمَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ إِنِ الْحُكْمُ There's no حَاكِم except Allah. إِنِ الْحُكْمُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ لَا رَازِقَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَا خَالِقَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَا خَالِقَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ No one created except Allah. Second level, إِحْسَان لَا مَطْلُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَا مَقْصُودَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَا مَحْبُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ None to be loved, no one to be desired. No one to be sought except Allah. So Wahdus al Wujud is nothing really exists in comparison to Allah except Allah. Allah is the only real existence. All existences are temporal and contingent and just accidental in a sense, they're temporary. So both the Muslim mutakallimin, the philosophers, and the mystics, this is the conclusion that they reached. Now it has to be better understood. Now remember Shawliullah Muhaddas Dinbi Rahmatullah What did he say? So, Shaulullah Bahandas Delvi Rahmatullah gave the topic of Wahdat al Wujud the name. Remember the person who translated the Quran? Right? The person who translated the Quran, uh, Shaulullah Bahandas Delvi, he agreed with the idea of Wahdat al Wujud. All the English translations, all the world translations, are because of him. So he saying Wahdat al Wujud seems to be the right and the correct opinion. And then in talking about because Sheikh Ahmed Sarhandi criticized Mahyuddin Arabi, I'm going to talk about that. But Shaulullah Muhaddas Devi, looking at history and what they had both written, came to the conclusion, the decisive conclusion, that Wah, and he called it uh, uh, Wujud uh, Tawhidi, the existence of Tawhid, that there is one existence, one true existence. This was the opinion of also Shaulullah Muhaddas Devi, which I'm going to explain what does it mean. What does that mean? In Hindustan, we have a top Hindustan. Asadullah Khan, Qiyamat hai Ke Bedil ki andaz mein Urdu mein shairi kata Urdu farsi ne ki Urdu ko rikhta kehte te pehle Ye nai zaban jo bani thi rikhta Tarz-e Bedil mein rikhta likhna Asadullah Khan, Qiyamat hai Lekin wo Asadullah Khan bhi ye kehte hai Jaro be la be aar Ke ee shirk fil wujud Ba gard e farshush so one of the great scholars he says in his poetry that to believe in your heart there is this and there is that there is this thing and that thing this event and that event this is also a type of shirk fil wujud shirk in existence because as I will further explain according to them nothing truly existed except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I will explain that as the time comes so Nothing exists. So bring a broom and remove anything that you think exists except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remove it. Nothing exists except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> 
if you believe in the existence of two things, you did shirk. البتہ جب تعین ہو گئی کسی شے کی وہ وجود مختلف ہے ذات باری سے الگ ہے بہرحال یہ مباحث ہیں اس آیت مبارکہ سے متعلق اور میں نے آپ کے سامنے ساری بات رکھ دی نہ میں کسی کا مبلغ ہوں نہ یہ دینی مسئلہ ہے دس از ناٹ اے ریلیجس افیئر ٹو بلیو ان دس اور ناٹ بلیو ان دس اٹس اے فلسفیکل اینڈ این ایشو اف علم الکلام بٹ اٹ از این ایشو in the sense that many of the great scholars of Islam reached this conclusion and to call them kafir or to name them or to abuse them because they held this belief which has which is a, a logical conclusion they reached it has nothing to do with the the belief in the attributes of Allah has nothing to believe in Allah as a rabb has nothing to be, do with believing in Allah as a raziq has nothing to do with the love of Allah the belief in Allah the reliance on Allah the humbleness and the khushu towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has nothing to do with any of that. But just a way of solving the issue of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He exists and He is the absolute existence, then how do you solve, and He is unlimited, then this was an issue. You can so, so just as if you agree with Imam Nathaniel, that Allah is in one place, He's there and we are here, which is the minority opinion in terms of Islamism. Or you hold the opinion of Shaulullah Muhammad Zaini Rahmatullahi that nothing truly existed except Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And let me just now mention. This is a philosophy of philosophy. In philosophy, there are many problems that will arise from the science of science. Those who read the Quran or read the Hadith are going to be confused. Now, what will happen? Today, we will think about it. In this way, this is a philosophy of philosophy that is always being worked on by the Holy Spirit. دین از شریع اینڈ طریقت از یوزلی فار اسلامک مسٹیسزم کلین یور ان سائڈ بیکم اے گڈ ہیومن بینگ لو اللہ اینڈ دا شریع ڈو سالا فار بی ان اوبیڈینس ٹو اللہ سبحانہ و تعالی اینڈ آؤٹ ورڈلی دی اوبیڈینس اینڈ ان ورڈلی دا لو آف اللہ دس از واٹس ایکچولی دا مین مقصود دا مین پرپس This third level, that nothing exists for, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a, a, a conclusion that some scholars, many, many scholars have reached. But it doesn't make somebody a kafir saying, I don't agree with Wahid al wujud Okay? And in the same way, if someone says, I don't agree with this, kind of like Allah is on his arsh and everything, Allah is separate from his creation, and this kind of like absolute separation between Allah and his creation, Uh, that the way that he's here with his attributes but he's not here personally and that the, Allah's attributes are different from his person, his being the questions that that raises if somebody doesn't agree with that that also should be not a problem you know and, and ultimately what is the reality is the reality so leave reality we will maybe never know reality تمہاری توجہ ہر وقت اپنی اس ذات کو جس جس نے تمہیں پیدا کیا ہے حقیقت تو وہی ہے لیکن سورج مکھی کے پھول بن جا لیکن اسے آپ غلط کہیں مجھے کوئی اعتراض نہیں لیکن یہ کہ ایک شخصیت کو میں ایسے سے واقف ہوں ناؤ ہی از کمنگ ٹو ہز مین پوائنٹ اباؤٹ سیکٹیرینزم جو اہل حدیث بھی کٹر تھے اور صوفی بھی بڑے تھے He was a mystic, he was a Sufi, as well as Ahli Hadith Salafi. And he had combined both of these in his personality. And he was not liked by any group, but he was a great scholar. He used to live in Afghanistan, then his family moved to Pakistan. And listen to what he says. This is what we have known as Ghaznavi Khandan. Maulana Abdullah Ghaznavi came to the اور وہ اپنے تصوف کی بعض آرا کی وجہ سے اور بعض اپنی اہل حدیثیت کی آرا کی وجہ سے افغانستان سے نکال دیے گئے تھے غزنی سے نکال دیے گئے تو امرتسر میں آ کر آباد ہوئے ان کی اولاد ہے یہ غزنوی خاندان ان میں مولانا داؤد غزنوی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ سے میرا بڑا قرب رہا ہے ان کے پھر بیٹے تھے ابو بکر غزنوی وہ معروف ہیں کافی لوگ ان سے واقف ہیں So he's talking about the Ghaznavi family. So, 
تضاد چیزوں کا مجموعہ تھے تصوف بھی اور اہل حدیثیت بھی یہ تصوف as well as he was saying. عام طور پر اہل حدیث کی ساری توجہ ظاہر پر رہتی ہے وہ بات جنرلی دا سلفی برادرز دے لک ایٹ دی ایکسٹرنل ایوری تھنگ ایکسٹرنل سلو کا ما رائیت مونی اسلی دے لک ایٹ دی ایکسٹرنل دے نو لک ایٹ دی انٹرنل میں جانتے ہی نہیں اندر نہیں جاتے فلسفے سے کوئی تعلق نہیں اینڈ دے ار ناٹ انٹرسٹڈ ان فلسفی ایٹ آل لیکن فلسفہ اور تصوف کے جڑے ہوئے ہیں اپس میں جولی اینڈ فلسفی اینڈ تصوف سوفیزم دے ار انٹرلنکڈ ڈابن کے ساتھ انہوں نے ایک دفعہ منڈومری میں جو سائیوال کہلا تھا آ کر تقریر کی اہل حدیث مسجد تھی میں بھی گیا ہوا تھا سننے کے لیے انہوں نے وہ اہل حدیث نوجوانوں سے کہہ رہے تھے کہ دیکھو تم اپنے مسلک پر قائم رہو ہم غیر مقلد ہیں ہم کسی کے مقلد نہیں ہیں نہ ابو حنیفہ کے نہ مالک کے لیکن کبھی بھی ان ائما کی توہین نہ کرنا سو ہی واز سینگ as a person who had combined these two aspects you can say far polars into one he was saying to the youth uh, look stay with what you are you want to be ahlul hadith you want to be salafi be salafi but don't make fun of those scholars yeah hamare aam naujawan jo kehte abu arifa ko kya pata like our average young youth like we saw in this video oh who's abu hanifa oh who's this ashraf ali thani oh who's this this you know this type of mockery this allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like this at all this type of attitude it's arrogance abu hanifa ke paas to ilm nahi tha abu hanifa to abu hanifa didn't have knowledge he didn't have any ilm al hadith and so on so forth jo hai ilm al hadith mein kore ye tauheen ke alfaz par istemal mein don't say these bad words acha is waas ke sath unhone misal di کہ دیکھیے شیخ محی الدین ان عربی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ کے سب سے بڑے مخالف شیخ احمد سرہندی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ تھے دی بگیسٹ اپوننٹ ٹو ابن العربی واز شیخ احمد سرہندی دی ون وی ٹاکڈ اباؤٹ ہو اپوزڈ دی کنگ اکبر اوکے اینڈ ہی روٹ دی کانسیپٹ اف وحدت الشہود بٹ ان فیکٹ اٹس ناٹ ویری ڈیفرنٹ but he wrote very vehemently against Ibn al-Arabi because of the level of pantheism that existed in the Indian subcontinent because of Hinduism. So now he is saying about Shaykh Ahmad Sarhandi Rahmatullah. I'm surprised that this is a Wahhabi man. Qatar Wahhabi, Ahl Hadith. I'm looking at this Wahhabi man. You know, he's a Wahhabi scholar and he's saying Rahmatullah Ali for Muhyuddin Arabi. So he was very surprised. Dr. Asraf Rahmatullah Ali. Sheikh Ibn Arabi 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 جو خاندان غزنوی خاندان سے انہوں نے شام کو کھانے پر بلایا مجھے ہی از ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ ہی واز انوائٹڈ اینڈ ہی میٹ ابو داؤد آئی بلیو ہز نیم واز غزنوی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ سو ہی از ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ دیٹ ایونٹ ان ہی ایکسپلین یہ بھی بلا لیا میں ان کا داماد بھی تھا نا تو وہاں میں نے کہا کہ حضرت آپ نے شیخ ابن عربی کے ساتھ رحمۃ اللہ علیہ کے الفاظ استعمال کیے سو ہی ایس Ibn al-Arabi and you said, Alhamdulillah alayhi, and you're a Salafi brother. So. Jabke Ibn Taymiyyah ne koi shari gali chhodi nahi hai unke liye. Whereas Ibn Taymiyyah didn't leave anything out for him. Zindig, mulhid. Or aap ahle hadith hai, ye kaise hua? Main unki azmat ka qail ho gaya, unki aankho mein aas hua gaya. Kehne ke daak sahab. یہ دونوں ہمارے بزرگ ہیں ہم خرد ہیں آپس کے اختلافات ہو جانے ہیں ہم چھوٹے ہیں خرد ہیں خرد رہنے ہی میں عافیت سمجھتے ہیں ہمارے لیے دو سو ہی واز گیونگ دی ایگزامپل ہی میٹ ہم ان ڈنر اینڈ ہی ہیز ٹو ہاؤ کین یو سی رحمت اللہ علیہ تو ابن العربی یو ار سن اف یور برادر اینڈ ہی سیڈ لک دیز ٹو دے ار دی ایلڈرز 
They want it's their it's their business with each other. We're small, okay, meaning we haven't died off yet with any uh, manifestation of Allah's takwa and so on and so forth. Those they're they're big ones. They fight with each other. That's their business. For us, afia and safety is in staying quiet about the dead and about the great ones that have been considered great, especially by the by a, a overwhelming majority. No, 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 no. اور مسجد میں انہوں نے ایک مثال بیان کی تھی کہ شیخ احمد سرحدی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ نے شیخ ابن عربی کے بارے میں اپنے مکتوبات میں لکھا ہے سو شیخ احمد سرحدی ان ہز رائٹنگز ہی رائٹس اباؤٹ شیخ شیخ العربی محی الدین عربی ان ہز کانسیپٹ اف ان ہز انڈرسٹینڈنگ بیکاز ہی ڈیڈ تھری ڈفرنٹ انڈرسٹینڈنگ دی وان وہ یوز ائی ایم فوکسنگ آن ون دیٹ نتھنگ ایگزسٹ وچ آئی ول ایکسپلین دی ایگزیکٹ میننگ اف دیٹ But he, in criticizing, because it should not go towards pantheism, that Allah is everything, as in everything that we see. No. That I will make clear. He said, We are of those who eat the crumbs off the tables of Ibn al-Arab, even though his strongest opponent, this is the other that Mujadid al-Afsani had for his strongest opponent, which was Muhyiddin Arabi. But he said, we are those who eat off the crumbs. In his lifetime, he wrote like, we eat the, off the crumbs of Muhyiddin Arabi. But what can I do? This is about the, about Allah. It's about the safat of Allah. ریگارڈنگ لیکن ہم ان کے دسترخوان کے جھوٹے ٹکڑے کھانے والے یہ کہہ رہے ہیں شیخ احمد سرحدی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ جن کے بارے میں مشہور ہے کہ ابن عربی کا یا تو مخالف اول ابن تیمیہ رحمۃ اللہ علیہ اور یا پھر مخالف دوم جس نے جوابی فلسفہ پیدا کیا وہ شیخ احمد سرحدی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ سو ایدر محیدین بگیسٹ اپوننٹ واز امام ابن تیمیہ اور ہز بگیسٹ اپوننٹ واز شیخ احمد سرحدی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ بٹ دس از دی ریسپیکٹ ہی از شو تو یہ ہے کہ ان چیزوں کے بارے میں اپنے سینوں کو وہ سب دیجیے اوپن یور ہارٹس ریگارڈنگ ڈفرینس آف اپینینس ود ان اسلام آپ ابن عربی کے نبات کو چھوڑ دیجیے پھینک دیجیے لیکن توہین نہ کریں تھرو ہز اپینین اوے ڈونٹ ڈس ریسپیکٹ ہم اس کو خام خا کفر سے تعبیر نہ کیجیے فار نو ریزن attempting to make him kafir don't do this ye cheeze jo hai aur fir hamare sare sufiya jo uske qail hain and then all of our people mystics imam, from imam nawi imam ghazali and so on and so forth that are in agreement with this fir unse mat zani ho gayi main sirf isliye ke wo bad zani aur dili nafrat ka mamla khatam ho jaye so for this reason that our closed minds to these concepts that we don't actually understand so that our hearts open up and to the to the people of the great scholars of the past that sometimes we don't like them because we think that this is what was meant by wahhabism which was when that is not what was meant main ye sari bahas is liye kiya karta hu warna mere aam durus mein in masail par guftugu nahi hoti bade gehre masail hai aur unka samajhna aam logon ke liye mumkin bhi nahi hai balki aam aadmi ke یہ جس کو کہتے ہیں نا ہشدار ہشدار کے رہ بر دب تیغس قدم را ہوشیار رہ جاؤ یہ تم جو چل رہے ہو یہ تلوار کی دھار کی طرح کا راستہ ہے کاٹ کے رکھ دے گا تمہیں جیسے ہم کہتے ہیں پل سراب جو ہے وہ بال سے زیادہ باریک ہوگا اور تلوار کی دھار سے زیادہ تیز ہوگا جس پر سے گزرنا اوکے ناؤ لیٹس انڈرسٹینڈ دس اباؤٹ وقت 
جو میری رائے سب بنی تھی وہ میں آپ کو بتا دیتا ہوں کہ میرے نزدیک دین اور شریعت اور طریقت یعنی دین کا جو عملی پہلو ہے شریعت بھی عملی پہلو ہے طریقت بھی عملی پہلو ہے فرق اس میں صرف یہ ہے کہ شریعت اس کے ظاہری پہلو سے بحث کرتی ہے طریقت اس کے باطنی پہلو سے بحث کرتی ہے لفظی طور پہ معنی بھی ایک ہے شارے بھی راستے کو کہتے ہیں طریق بھی راستے کو کہتے ہیں So these are the two aspects that a Muslim is required to contain himself in. And Islam deals with the external. Iman and Ihsan deal with the internal. And this word tariqa, and so there is Islam, uh, there is uh, Sharia and tariqa, and then uh, you can say haqiqa. But حقیقت no one can maybe attain to so Islam doesn't deal with that per se directly طریق بھی راستہ تو اصل میں چلنا طریقت شریعت دونوں کی معنی چلنا اب چلنے میں یہ ہے کہ ایک جو دین کے احکام ہیں اب نماز ہے اس کے کیا آداب ہیں کیا شرائط ہیں اس میں تعبیر ارکان ہے نماز کے اوقات ہیں وغیرہ وغیرہ وضو کے کیا فرائض ہیں کیا سنن ہیں کیا نوافل ہیں وغیرہ وغیرہ مستحبات اس سے بحث شریعت کرتی ہے فقہ کا تعلق کرتا ہے So Sharia is dealing mostly with fiqhi issues. So if you're doing prayers, the wudu, the prayers, the takbir al-tahrima, the reading of the fatiha, all these ameen out loud, this is the Sharia. Then having khushu, concentration, focus, love, devotion, all these things in your salah, now this is the mystical or the ihsan aspect or the tariqat aspect. The presence of mind, the presence of heart in your salah. This is an issue of tariqah. And they work side by side. They're interrelated. This activity that's within the deen, the actionable uh, aspects, with, with either with the heart or with your limbs, It's based upon both of these, Islam and, or you can say Sharia and Tariqat, the purification of the heart as well as the external, which is Islam versus Iman, right, the internal. This is based upon duality, that there is me and then there is Allah. Sanviyat, Tasmiyat, both. There's Abd and Ma'bud, servant and the one who is worshipped. Muhib and Mahbub, the one who is loving and the one who is loved, meaning Allah. You know. So the point now about, let me quickly mention this, about Wahid uh, al-Wujud that needs to be understood so we understand this. In its proper form here. And that is that all of Allah's attributes are absolute. So His existence is absolute. Allah sees, I also see. But compared to Allah, I'm completely blind and more blind than blind men. Allah has knowledge, I also have knowledge, but Allah's knowledge is absolute. And my knowledge is contingent about Allah giving it to me. But His knowledge is the absolute knowledge. His existence is absolute. My existence is not absolute. My existence is temporal. My existence is temporary. My existence is nothing in ratio proportion compared to Allah. And the same is with the entire universe and everything created. Everything that is created is nothing in comparison to Allah. Just like in the dua of istikhara. Where the Prophet ﷺ said to the Prophet, Allah ma inni astakhiruka bi ilmika wa bi qudratika. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked you by your knowledge that is absolute in your qudra. Anta ta'lamu wa la a'lamu. You know and I don't know. What did the Prophet mean when he said this? If you take it literally, 
it would not be correct because the Prophet knew something, he knew some of the Quran and said, Ta'lamu wa la I know nothing, you know everything in comparison. Then and the takdiru wa la you have the ability to do all things. I have no ability to do anything. In comparison to what you can do, I can't do anything. My existence, so in terms of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah's existence is absolute and it is permanent and ours is temporal and it is it is hadith and Allah is qadir. This is what is meant by wahdat al And just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no, there's no, and this is now specifically to the Wahdatul Wujud of Shaulullah Muhaddad Zilbi Rahmatullah Alayhi and the Shah and the Wahdatul Wujud of uh, the Wahdatul Wujud of uh, Shaykh Ahmad Sarhandi Rahmatullah Alayhi and Mahmud Al Hassan Rahmatullah Alayhi. That is that, and that is that nothing exists except for Allah, and uh, everything exists in the Tawajjuh of Allah, in the Tawajjuh, in the, in, the, in the concentration of Allah, just like if I think about any building in my mind, it exists in my mind. It doesn't exist so strongly, but it exists. But with Allah's concentration, something exists completely and fully. And this is the manifestation of the name of Allah, Al-Qayyum, the one who's holding everything together by his concentration on it, by his absolute concentration on it. So this is what it's been. Now you may agree, you may disagree. You may not like it, you may like it. But when you have something in your mind, and this is just a tamseel, this is just an example, because we don't know anything about Allah. But when you have something in your mind, there is no front, back, up, down. There is no, he's there and we are here. We we are created in the tawajjuh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or by his saying, kun fayakun. And this is explained most you can say beautifully in the in the saying of the prophet uh, in the in the ayah ayat hadith who al awwal wal akhir wal zahir wal batin wa huwa bi kulli shay'in alim now let me share that with you mai ye samajhta hu ke quran e majid mein ye ayah e mubarak ka huwa al awwal wal akhir wal zahir wal batin ye wahdat al wujud ke liye nafs e qat'i he considers dr samir al this verse as almost as nasul qat'i when it comes to the issue of wahdat al wujud because now he's going to give the example of that. Is Aya Mubarka ko parhiye ho wal awwal ho wal aakhir ho wal zahir ho wal baatir. Chand chizhe jo tafsiri aitbar se mene note karai hai. Or bas kismati se Maulana Islahi sahab jaysi shaks ne bhi ibar tawajjo nahi ki. Halanke usool unke haan bayan hua hai. Maulana Farahi Rahmatullah alayka bayan karda usool hai. Ke Allah Ta'ala ke asmao sifat ke darmiyan Quran mein kahi harf aqaf nahi aata. There's no... Ataf, in and between the names of Allah in any place in Quran except here. وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمِ Like this. All the names of Allah. There's no and because he is simultaneously and is, he is angry and happy. He's sometimes this, he's sometimes that. But Allah is his attributes all the time simultaneously. So now keeping this in mind, except in this verse you have Wa Atf. The first point. You won't find Rahim. You won't find this anywhere. Samyun Basir. You won't find Samyun wa 
اور جس کی سب سے بڑی مثال کیا ہے کہ آٹھ اسما آئے ہیں تسلسل کے ساتھ بغیر آتا ہے In the example of Sultan Hadji in the last three verses, Al Malik al Qudus al Salam al Mu'min al Muhaymin al Al, eight names of Allah without any wall, no end, because he's all his attributes at the same time. Al Malik al Qudus al Salam al Mu'min al Muhaymin al Aziz al Jabbar al Mutahabbir. No atav, no end, no connection. تمام صفات چاہے وہ ہمارے نزدیک متضاد بھی ہو اس کی ہستی میں بیک وقت موجود ایون اف ان آر فیلنگ ٹو نیمز اف اللہ دیٹ سیم ٹو بی اپوزٹ بٹ دے آر ان اللہ لائک رحیم رائٹ اینڈ ہی از فار ایگزامپل ہی از رحیم اینڈ ہی از آلسو وٹ المنتقم دی ون ہو ٹیکس ریونج سو ٹو نیمز اف اللہ المعز المذل The one who honors and the one who takes away the honor. Al-Yuhi, Al-Mumit. Al-Hayy, the one who gives life. Al-Mumit, the one who takes away the life. So two opposite names of Allah, attributes of Allah, are simultaneously true all the time. Our sifat ka tasabur hai ki jab ghussa aya wa ghussa hai, jab ab hum razi hai to razi hai, yeh dono chizhe bai ek waktu nahi ho sakti. For us the matter is, if we're happy, we're happy. If we're sad, we're sad. Generally these two things don't combine. اللہ تعالیٰ کی صفات متضاد بھی ہیں القابض الباسط قابض سکیڑنے والا القابض الباسط the one who shrinks things الباسط the one who extends things الباسط کھولنے والا الرافع المذل الرافع the one who raises up المذل the one who throws down And this is a very big thing, indeed, that Allah has these attributes at all the time. So Tawheed doesn't even accept that there should be an wow ataf between the names of Allah. Al-Tahir Nahum mein, wo yeh ke mughairat hai. اللہ کی ذات کے میں صفات کے درجے میں بھی مغائرت نہیں لیکن سوال یہ ہے کہ جب یہ اتنا بڑا فلسفہ ہے اور اتنی بڑی بات ہے اور اس سے اتنا بڑا نتیجہ نکالا گیا اور اتنی بڑی معرفت حاصل ہوئی وہاں اس پر بحث کیوں نہیں کی کہ ہو الاول و الاخر و ظاہر و الباطن یہاں واو کیا ناؤ ہیئر وائی ڈز دس واو آیا اب سن حدیث سے ہو الاول و الاخر و ظاہر و الباطن و ہوا بکل شین عالم So there has to be a big reason why. In all of the Qur'an there's no wow between the names of Allah and over here there's a wow, the wow at the end between the names of Allah. Al-Zahir and Al-Batin can be at the same simultaneous. میرا ظاہر میرا باطن وہ کو ایگزسٹ کرے گی they can coexist ظاہر and باطن can coexist نماز کا ظاہر نماز کا باطن کو ایگزسٹ کرے گی the صلاح has a ظاہر and a باطن it can coexist ایک وقت ہوں گے الاول والآخر تو کو ایگزسٹ نہیں کر سکتے الاول والآخر the first and the last cannot coexist at the same time حسن تو ہو یا پھر محمد الفاظ ہے الاول الاخر Or it could mean first and then the last. This exception of Wal Ataf here. The, these four words have always want mudaf ilay because it has to do with first, last, and like zahir bafin, right? So they always want mudaf ilay, which is not mentioned here. 
کس کا اول اول آپ نے رمضان کے بارے میں جو روایت آتی ہے اول ہو مغفرت ہوں اوسط ہوں وہ کیا ہے اول ہو رحمت ہوں اوسط ہوں مغفرت ہوں وہ آخر اور میں نے آج دیکھا تمام آیات اول کا لفظ جو ہے بغیر کسی مضافلے کے یہی آیا ہے صرف Only in one place in Quran, there's a wow atif in every ayah. And only in one place in Quran, the word awwal comes without mudaf ilayh. That's here. Warna, ana awwalul abidin, ana awwalul muslimin, awwala marrah, har jaga. Awwala marrah, for example, first time. So every first has a mudaf of what it's talking about in the whole of Quran except here. Wo mudaf ki aise se aayega. اس کا آخر کسی شے کوئی شے ہے کوئی وجود ہے کوئی ہے کوئی حقیقت There is something that he is first of and something he is last of. What is that? جس کا سے اول و آخر آئے گا اسی طرح ظاہر اور باطن اب اس کی مثال تو اسی سورہ حدیث میں موجود ہے فضور با بینہ ہم بسور اللہو بابن باطنہو فی الرحمہ وظاہرہو من قبل الہزا وظاہرہو This is in Surah Hadith itself Where Allah talks about the wall, once you're in the Sirat al-Mustaqim and you're going in the wall, comes down, those that are inside the wall, the bathin of it, there's rahma wa zahiruhu, and the one that are outside it, they will have to face the punishment. معلوم یہ ہوا کہ اب یہ معین چیزیں وہ مضافل ہے کیا ہے ان کا So now to figure out what is the مضافل What's being possessed What is it being talked about here یہ چاہ رہے ہیں تقاضہ کر رہا ہے الفاظ تقاضہ کر رہا ہے مضافل These words are telling you find my مضافل ہے مضافل ہے اس کا یہ سلسلہ کون و مکان This creation This creation He is the first before creation. He needs the last after creation. There is no existence except Allah. Meaning, He is there in the beginning of it and the end of it. Everything has a beginning. Everything has an end. One is temporal. One is one is uh, one is eternal. اللہ کی ذات قدیم اور یہ کائنات حادث اس کائنات کا اول بھی اللہ ہے اس کا آخر بھی اللہ ہے اس کا ظاہر بھی اللہ ہے اس کا باطن بھی اللہ ہے اللہ از دا فرسٹ اف بیفور دس کریشن اللہ ول بی دا لاسٹ افٹر دس کریشن اللہ از دا موسٹ ابویس دا ظاہر اینڈ دا موسٹ ہیڈن اف دس ان دس کریشن از دا موسٹ اپیرنٹ ان دس کریشن ہی از دا موسٹ ہیڈن ان دس کریشن ہی از دا فرسٹ بیفور دس کریشن ہی از دا لاسٹ افٹر دس کریشن تو وہی وہ ہے اور ہے کیا دین دیر از اونلی ہم He's the first, he's the last, and what's in between is temporal. Nothing really exists except for him. Every few seconds you say, this is there, this is there, this is there. Every moment you're a different person, you're not there anymore. You're not the person you were before, you're not there anymore. Nothing really is there except Allah. You are sad. اولہو اللہ آخرہو اللہ باطنہو اللہ ظاہرہو اللہ آخر کوئی بات بھی نہیں غالباً یہ تو حضرت جنید کا قول ہے لیسا فی ذمتی اللہ جنید 
Rahmatullah says, Laysa fi jumbati illallah. There's nothing by my side except Allah. In reality. So, Munazir Ahsan Gilani Rahmatullah, he gives the example of this now. Creation so he gives the example of like there's a carpenter, he has wood, from the wood he makes a chair. In the same way there's takhliq of insan, from mud, mud was already there, so there's takhliq. Ibda is the origination of creation. The raw material, the making of the raw material is ibda. Takhliq, khalq happens once the raw material is there and then you make something from that's already there. Ibda is neo ex helio. It didn't exist and you brought it into existence. And takhliq khalq, creation is you something is already there, mud, and then from mud you made a human being. It is the creation of the mind. That's the third. So that is what most of the Mujaddideen of the Indian subcontinent, they believed in. If you look at a, a, a minaret, right? If you look at a minaret, you have a exam, you have a, your mind creates the picture of the minaret. So now your mind has created a minaret. Now when you created this minaret, you are on top of it, you are on the side of it, you are around it. You're everywhere, but again. It has no real existence except by your concentration on it. As soon as your concentration goes away, its existence goes away. So I mentioned this, Al-Qayyub, the name of Allah, is near this concept. He's not existing because of any contingent reasons. He exists because of himself, through himself. Our existence is completely 100% dependent upon him. Our, our thinking makes something be but also not be but in reality when Allah wants something to be it is and Allah's thinking or Allah's irada, irada, his intent, his thinking. When he wants, he thinks of something, he decides upon something, he says be. In his mind, so to say from this example, 
you know, may Allah uh, protect us from making mistakes. It is a very dangerous rope here. But Allah says, be, and it is. And there's no limit, there's no, this, this concept doesn't limit Allah in any way. There's no Allah is there and I am here. There's only one real reality, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The relationship Allah ka is kainat ke saath wohi hai ke jo aap ka apni kisi zehni takhleek ke saath So its relationship with like my mind when I think of a minaret is the same relationship Allah has with this creation in the sense that there's no displacement of time and space like there's no limitness by space when I think of something there's no issue of space or time as long as I'm concentrating on a certain picture, let's say a minaret, it exists and has nothing to do with me being limited in terms of it, in terms of space and time. There's no like, I'm here, you're there. There's no many existences. There's only one existence. This verse of the Quran, Dr. Asramullah says, this verse can lead you to no other logical conclusion except this. So this he's given the proof in terms of the context of the ayah, its wordings and its linguistics and its grammar and so on and so forth. Now he will come to the hadith of the Prophet Two verse, two ahadiths in regards to this issue, this verse of the Quran. In one, one hadith is even quoted by Mona Namadudi and Mona Islah. He was also quoting it, but the other one, for some reason, they didn't quote it. The first one that everyone wrote is the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu while praying to Allah, doing dua to Allah, this hadith is very authentic, has many talks, many narrations, and so now the Prophet says to Allah, you're the first one, there's nothing before you. You're the last and there's nothing after you. You're the most manifest, there's nothing on top of you. And you're the most hidden and there's nothing other than you. Now, the second hadith, this is also narrated by Abu Hurairah. The Prophet said, if you were to throw down a rope, down, to the lowest of the earth, it would come upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It would reach Allah. To 
to the lowest of the earth or to the lowest part of the earth. Now, as you know, there's seven heavens going up, Sabaqa, and then there's seven earths, meaning within the earth there could be seven layers, or it can be referring to seven earths, one going down, 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 down to the lowest. So if you put a rope to the lowest of the earth, it will reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah will go down. And Abu Huraira says, Thumma qara'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the Prophet read this verse of the Quran, هُوَ الْأَوَّلُ وَالْآخِرُ وَالْظَاهِرُ وَالْبَاطِنُ وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ شَيْنَ عَمِيمٌ هُوَ الْأَوَّلُ وَالْآخِرُ وَالْظَاهِرُ وَالْبَاطِنُ لَوْ أَنَّكُمْ بَلَّيْتُمْ بِحَبْلٍ اگر تم لٹکاؤ ایک رسی إِلَى الْأَرْضِ السُّفْلَى اب جو کہ آیا ہے نا پورا طلاق میں بھی وَمِنَ الْأَرْضِ مِسْلَحُنَّ جیسے سات آسمان ہیں زمینیں بھی سات ہیں Like the seven heavens and the seven earths اب اس کی کیا حقیقت ہے یہ ابھی تو ہمیں نہیں معلوم لیکن ایک خیال یہ ہے کہ زمین کے سات طبقات ہوں گے ہم جیسے سکتا ہے طبقات ہوتا ہے یا یہ تو سات زمین ہیں لیکن تصور یہی ہے کہ سب سے نیچے ان میں رشتہ جو ہے وہ اوپر نیچے کا ہے جیسے سبا سماوات انتباقا ہیں وہ ایک دوسرے کے اوپر ہیں سات جو آسمان ہیں اسی طریقے سے یہ بھی کوئی ایک نیچے پھر نیچے پھر نیچے پھر نیچے سات بھی اور سب سے عرض سفلہ کے اوپر بھی اگر وہ رسی جائے گی تو جا کے کہاں ٹکے گی اللہ پر ٹکے گی Where will the rope come down to? Allah سبحانہ وتعالی یہ ہے وحدت الوجود This is وحدت الوجود What this حدیث is saying اب اس حدیث سے صرف نظر یا غرض بسر اب یہاں دیکھئے کہ میرا موقف کیا ہے عوام الناس کے لیے حضور نے تسہیل کر دی اس حدیث کے ذریعے سے The Prophet made it easy with that dua That's for the common people کون اس چکروں میں پڑھے گا کس میں انت الولو ایک دعا کی شکل میں لیکن یہ کہ کسی یہ خواص کا معاملہ ہوگا جن کے سامنے یہ بات بیان ہوئی ہوگی اس میں یہ ہے کہ اللہ کی ذات اس کے وجود وجود کیسا ہے فوق میں بھی وہی ہے تحت میں بھی وہی ہے ساتویں آسمان کے اوپر عرش عرش پر بھی وہی ہے اور ساتویں جن میں سب سے نکلی زمین ہے وہاں بھی اللہ ہی ہے اللہ ہی 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 ہوا الاول و الاخر اور پھر آیت پڑھی سمہ قرآ رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم اور پھر آیت پڑھی سمہ قرآ رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم اور پھر آیت پڑھی سمہ قرآ رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم اور پھر آیت پڑھی سمہ قرآ رسول وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ شَيْنِ عَلِيمٌ اچھا وہ جو دعا ہے اس پر ایک منطقی اعتراض وارد ہوتا ہے کونسی اتنی مشکل ہو گیا ہے مسئلہ انت الاول فلیس قبل کشیئن اے اللہ تو ہی وہ الاول ہے جس سے پہلے کچھ نہیں کوئی شہ نہیں so he's explaining the dua the first one that makes it easier وَالْأَوَّلُ أَنْتَ الْأَوَّلُ لَيْسَ قَبْلَكَ شَيْءٍ Allah, you're the first before you, there's nothing. وَأَنْتَ الْآخِرُ فَلَيْسَ بَعْدَكَ شَيْءٍ اور اللہ تو ہی وہ الْآخِر ہے کہ جس کے بعد کوئی شَيْءٍ نہیں And you're the الْآخِر after which there's nothing. وَأَنْتَ الْظَاهِرُ فَلَيْسَ فَوْقَكَ شَيْءٍ اب یہاں پر حضور نے ظاہر کو اس معنی ملے غالب تو وہ غالب ہستی ہے جس کے اوپر کوئی نہیں فوقا meaning dominant غالب There's nothing, you're the most dom, dominant, there's nothing on top of you, meaning you're at the, the peak of power, so to say. Nothing on top of you in terms of rank. There's, you are so hidden that there's nothing, after, uh, nothing without you. There's nothing more subtle than you. گویا کہ اس حدیث کے حوالے سے آپ بس اللہ کا شکر ہے اس سے انسان چل جائے گا گزر جائے گا لیکن یہ جو امام الرادی کھڑے ہو گئے ہیں اعلم من نحاد المقام مقام الغانز المحیم العمیق یہ ہے مسئلہ اب یہ حدیث جو ہے میں کہتا ہوں حیرت سے یہ حدیث موجود ہو یا تو یہ کہ صاحب علم نہیں ہے پڑھی نہیں ہے یہی ماننا پڑے گا ورنہ میرے نظر 
میں اس کے لیے لفظ بدیانتی سے کم جو ہے استعمال نہیں کر سکتا اگر معلوم ہونے کے باوجود اسے کوٹ نہیں کر رہا ایک شخص دیانت کا تقاضا تو یہ آپ رد کر دیں آپ کہیں کہ یہ حدیث جو ہے درایتم غلط ہے ہمارا جو you know that they that, that the hadith exists so you have to deal with it and then you can say i don't agree with it or whatever it is but it's there it's there and it has to be dealt with and it fits in with the quran and it fits in with the concept of there's only one true real existence which is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qabil qubul nahi ya uski sanad mein koi bata dijiye naqsh aur aib bata dijiye ki hum isliye qabil qubul hamare liye nahi ke iske sanad mein do bhi kuch kare لیکن قارئین کے ساتھ دیانت کا معاملہ یہ نہیں ہے اگر ہاں علم میں نہیں ہے تو بات اور وہ وہ تو پھر کون سی لو انکم دلیتم بحبل پیپل ار جسٹ اسکنگ ابت نیریشن ال الارض السفلا لا حبت علی اللہ حبوط گرنا احبطو احبطو منا So I think this is enough to explain to you that when somebody comes on a podcast and gives wind to sectarianism and then doesn't realize this intellectual heritage is well thought out, it is very active, it has so many different levels, and so I hope you were able to benefit historically, you were able to benefit in terms of your idea about the cognition and the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala absolute reality Allah's absolute reality I hope this uh, inter- gets internalized in me and all of you inshallah and I hope this was beneficial inshallah jazakumullah khairan assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah